Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for this Forum for Philosophy event on anti-vaxxers and other skeptics. The LSE's programme of public events this year is structured around the theme of shaping the post-COVID world. I find that optimistic. I think we're still very much trapped in the COVID world. We don't know the way out. We don't know if there is a way out. That's why we're doing this event online rather than in a lecture theatre in person. Now, one of the ways out, one of the great sources of hope for many people is the possibility of a vaccine, ideally some kind of wondrous vaccine that will be 100% effective and that will give us all complete immunity from coronavirus. But here we've run into a problem because it's not just about the vaccine, it's about the vaccination program. And for any vaccination program to really work, there needs to be enough uptake. Enough people need to be willing to receive it. And what we've seen across the world over the past 10 years are problems of confidence, problems of trust in vaccination leading to public confidence in vaccination programs stagnating, in some places even declining. Now, to be clear, our theme in this event is not, do vaccines work? You know, our question in this event is not, are they effective public health interventions? Our panelists agree that they certainly can be. Our theme is trust. The question is about problems of trust, what has led, what leads people to lose trust in vaccination programs and in the medical profession more widely? And what can be done to build trust and to regain trust and to try and solve these problems? And it's a pleasure to be joined by three panelists who are bringing really interesting and very different perspectives to bear on these questions of trust in the medical profession. They are Heidi Larson, Director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, author of the book Stuck, How uh, Vaccine Rumours Start and Why They Don't Stop. Catherine Furman, a philosopher of science from the University of Liverpool, and Rohin Francis, a cardiologist who also engages with the public directly on medical issues through his YouTube channel, Medlife Crisis. So let's start with you, Heidi, and with the question, how bad are things? Should we be fearful of a COVID-19 vaccine not receiving enough uptake to actually give us a way out of this crisis? Well, um, I, I suppose I wouldn't, you know, thank you, uh, Jonathan, that was an <laughs> excellent framing. And um, I think the looking at it from the trust perspective is, is really important. Um, I suppose I wouldn't use the term fearful so much because we have time to avert that. Um, we're running out of time as we get closer to a potential vaccine, but I do think it's, it's very worrying, um, the trends in um, vaccine skepticism around COVID from the public health community. I think there was a hope that uh, with such a... a debilitating and, and fatal pandemic that those who had questions about vaccine would turn around and appreciate the value of vaccine. But instead, what's happened is there's been a, an amplification of distrust in the context, mm. uh, in this hyper uncertainty, and also different groups coming together. Um, the anti-vaccine groups joining the anti um, uh, lockdown and anti-masking groups with a shared uh, narrative of, you know, pro-freedom, pro-choice. So it, it's, mm -hmm. it is concerning, um, but I do think um, we're, the clock is ticking, but we still have time to try to avert that mm. uh, trend and rebuild some trust. But a matter of months, potentially. Yeah, really um, ticking. it's really, we sh yesterday was when we should have uh, been more yeah. proactive about it. I mean, yeah. I genuinely thought that with the pandemic and your vaccine skepticism would go away, suddenly it yeah. would disappear. 
And that hasn't happened at all. I saw a poll recently in America suggesting around half of people would be willing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, is this, is this a problem that is serious in the UK or is it a problem that, that is elsewhere in the world? Well, I happened to be on a panel this morning um, where one of the, this was the London Assembly, um, uh, looking at some of the issues in London uh, for, the, to, for the mayor's benefit. Um, and one of the researchers that was uh, invited with me talked in a, in a sample of 35,000 uh, people in the UK saw that 70% were concerned about side effects, 54% um, believed in natural immunity over vaccination. Um, there were nearly 40% that thought that vaccine, this vaccine thing was really about big business and making money. So didn't really trust the motives and motive is a big determinant of trust. Um, and then there were a quarter that were skeptical that they would even work. So that's, that's just mm. in the UK. That's, that's highly. And what percentage do we need to get, uh, you know, so-called herd immunity as people say? Well, if you actually accept the vaccine, uh, we won't know till we have the vaccines, which tell us how effective they each are. But I, what I'm hearing in, in the research community is probably um, 60 to 70 percent. Um, and we're not there. So this is a, re a real problem for the UK, not just other it's, countries. I mean, Absolutely. Your vaccine confidence project is about studying the entire world, right? And, and vaccine confidence yes. across the whole world. I mean, what what patterns have you have you discovered from from studying vaccine trust? Well, actually, we just published a big paper in the Lancet last earlier this month that was five years of our vaccine confidence data in nearly 150 countries and 285,000 people around the world. Uh, multiple following multiple waves. And the short answer is the state of the world's confidence is highly volatile. I think 10, certainly 20 years ago, people's sentiments about vaccines were far more stable. You knew who were the religious groups that were resistant. You knew where there was a marginalized group that was less trusting and you had to work a bit harder to get them engaged. And you knew the, which part of the population were, would generally accept. You just, that is no longer the picture. It's a bit more like political opinion polling with a swing vote in the middle and, and mm. polarized extremes. And that's not, that's not a coincidence. It just reflects how highly politicized the whole vaccine issue has become. It raises a question about causes. You know, what, what is causing this volatility? What is it that leads people who perhaps 20 years ago would just have deferred to medical expertise and said, that, you know, the experts say get vaccinated, so get vaccinated. No longer, that automatic trust is no longer there. Do you think? Yeah, and that's absolutely true. Uh, the default is to question these days. And uh, my book, Stuck, that you uh, mentioned, it's actually coming out in the UK in the next couple of weeks. It came out in the US a couple of months ago, um, is, is about what's driving it behind. Um, and not unlike uh, Brexit and the election of Trump, um, it, there, these have been trends uh, among certain population groups that have been uh, building uh, emotions in certain ways that have caught some people surprised, particularly the health authorities. But actually, there has been a trend for a while. I mean, I set up the Vaccine Confidence Project mm. 10 years ago, and I had started to work on it more as an individual researcher 15, 20 years ago. Um, these are not brand new trends, but they have been growing. I think what's amplified it has certainly been the social media and the hyper connection mm. and the ability to spread. But these sentiments uh, were there. Um, what's changed it uh, has been the quick spread and, and the way that you can use these social networks to organize um, mm. remotely. 
do you blame social media companies for just letting this letting i suppose conspiracy theories just spread like wildfire well, I don't blame them. Um, I do think that they have some level of accountability to respond in the same way a number of people have. If you shut down Facebook tomorrow, this problem would not go away. Um, these are about deep human emotions and anxieties and fears and 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 uh, hopes also. I mean, there mm. are hope is one of the emotions. Um, but I do think where they can have a key role is reining in the, uh, the algorithms that amplify them and spread them so quickly. Um, I often say we don't have a misinformation problem. We have a, we have a relationship mm. problem and that's the, the it's broken a trust, trust problem. Issue. Yeah. That relationship of trust that it's we need very to relational. Mm, between people yeah. and doctors, it's, it's becoming strange. I mean, let's bring Ro Rohin in on this. Now, as a practicing doctor, you've, you face that challenge of building trust with, uh, with patients in everyday life. And um, are, are you seeing more growing problems of trust in the medical profession? Um, I have to say, sort of in my day-to-day -day work, um, I don't think anything's changed particularly, but obviously we can't really remove any of that from the context of COVID in, in, in the last few months. And, and certainly that's been a big, uh, uh, that, you know, there's been a noticeable change in, in patients' attitudes and, and um, the, the, the likelihood to believe or to, to mistrust the medical profession. Um, I had a feeling you were sort of going to ask me about sort of whether that has changed in recent years. So I, I did, mm. I, I tried to do a bit of, um, give, give a bit more of a data-driven answer to this. And, and um, Professor Larson's work that she mentioned, uh, you know, which is an amazing um, piece of work. I was, I was looking at that and as well as uh, lots of other um, studies to, to see if mistrust has grown, because obviously it's always been present. Um, you know, there's always been um, skepticism of the medical uh, profession, but for many years that was entirely justified um, and you know I think you, you've already mentioned I think social media has been the, the big mm. factor that has changed things in, in recent years um, so I'm a, a cardiologist and I think it provides a kind of interesting kind of um, case study a sort of dual case study and that my day-to-day -day work uh, involves a lot of treating of acute emergencies so blocked arteries heart attacks stopped hearts and the effects are very obvious. They're very, they're very real and direct. And the treatment is immediate. You know, the, the, the benefit is, 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 is apparent to, to anyone. So I don't really encounter any kind of skepticism about what I'm suggesting to a patient in that kind of scenario. Somebody with mm. crushing chest pain tends to just go along with what the doctors suggest. Right. Yeah, and vaccines are very different from that context, yeah. aren't they? When you're healthy... <laughs> Exactly. So, so the, the, the analogous thing within my own kind of work is, is kind of long-term risk modification diet. So diet is a, mm. is a field where we see a great deal of misinformation because the results are less tangible, they, they take decades. And just like um, with vaccines or say we've seen with masks for, for COVID-19, you're suggesting an intervention even if it's quite a minor one in, in, you know, uh, in terms of something like wearing a mask, that doesn't have an immediate uh, tangible benefit. And, and that, that's the kind of scenario where we see a lot of misinformation come in. To some so, extent, we're asking people for this leap of faith, aren't we? That you're yeah. healthy, you've not got it, but trust us, this intervention is gonna help the general population. And that trust us, it really does require this, this leap. So um, I've got, uh, questions coming in in the in the q and a I'm just going to throw one of those out there now this particular case of the covid vaccine we know it's being developed super fast and there's this attempt to compress into a period of months a process that normally takes years that sort of it leads to fear doesn't it it leads to this question how do you why, why should in a way the public trust a vaccine that's been put together in months. Uh, I mean, Heidi, what do you what do you think about the, the special challenges posed there? 
and you're muted, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure why. It'd be great to have all of everyone unmuted, please. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I think it's understandable, uh, the anxiety. One of the big, it was one of the biggest inhibitors of people's uptake of the H1N1 vaccine during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 is way, this is way too quick. And that's a much more familiar vaccine. That was just a new strain in the in the usual um, seasonal flu vaccine. This is a brand new virus. We're still learning about it every day. It's a brand new vaccine um, and it's, it's quicker. But what we have failed to do as a scientific community and as a communications from a, from a media point of view, we haven't talked about why is, are things moving faster? And you get this impression that it's a short changed uh, process uh, in making vaccines. In fact, this is not shortcutting old processes. These are brand new platforms. We have new technologies. We characterize the virus much quicker than usual because of new technologies. We had a funding mechanism in place that we didn't have before Ebola that was specifically for new and emerging viruses like this. And that was because at a, during Ebola, we said, whoa, there's no funding mechanism for something like this. So we had that yeah. to kickstart the trials. And then we have these new technologies with how to make a vaccine. So. Uh, there are good reasons this is moving faster. Mm. And I think if people understood that, it might make them understand that we're not, um, you know, shortchanging the more traditional process. That's great. I'd love to bring Catherine in on this, on uh, Ebola. I mean, you have a shared interest with Heidi in the case of Ebo <laughs> Ebola. I mean, is that a success story? Well, I mean, is, is that a case where vaccine trials, you know, these problems of trust have been overcome? So I don't know about whether or not that counts as a success story. Um, my work on Ebola was largely the, the early days of intervention and how badly wrong that went because there wasn't appropriate trust. Again, I think Heidi yeah. is the, the real expert on how um, trust in vaccines has gone. I remember originally there were African countries who wanted to kick out the, the trials because they couldn't see that there was any yeah. direct benefit to their populations. Um, and they were cautious that they were being used as guinea pigs um, and so there's this kind of long history of medical abuse and malpractice um, in many African countries. Mm. And so there was a lot of suspicion initially about trials going on in those countries. I mean, Heidi, how do you, how do you build trust in that kind of situation where you've got, I mean, in, in, in Western nations like the UK, we've at least been benefiting from vaccination programs for countless decades, you know, so there's this baseline of, we can all remember, vaccines that we've taken and, and we've got great public health benefit from it you know in other contexts like trying to trial Ebola vaccines in Africa presumably the problems of trust are even more serious well um let's see my internet connection is unstable well I'll give it a go <laughs> um I, I've been <laughs> I've been leading on uh, trust building and rumor management around uh, Ebola vaccine trials for the last five years uh, in uh, Sierra Leone, DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda. But the, the stage one trials in Ghana were indeed totally suspended because of rumors. In fact, we did a short investigative uh, video um, piece on it, which is on our website. If you write controversial Ghana trials, uh, we went around to um, local leaders, newscasters, uh, the parliament, to different people for their interpretation of these rumors. But basically, it was this issue of, you know, wait a minute, you know, why are you doing a trial in Ghana when we don't have Ebola? We know better, we're not stupid to, or to be able to test efficacy. Some people need it and some don't, this is gonna give us Ebola. I mean, a whole range of things. And the questions so paralyzed the government that they suspended both of these stage one trials. Um, but then, you know, that happened early on. So that was quite a wake up call, but we, 
um, built uh, in, in these other four countries, networks of community listeners, deeply locally engaged with rapid um, every week feeding back to the clinical team what they're hearing, how you know in their interaction in the clinic they should say um, they had concerns about blood blood stealing and blood selling like why are they taking so much blood they must be selling it. And what we did was tell, talk to the clinical staff and they they when they took blood, they showed a big pen and said, this is how much we're taking. Um, because you know, the tube goes, <laughs> you don't really see where it goes when people are taking blood necessarily. Um, but when they saw that it was as much as like a big pen or, or whatever pen, um, I don't mean to brand, <laughs> promote a brand here. I just <laughs> had it in my mind. Um, but they said, oh, is that all? Like, is that enough? Mm. Um, <laughs> Um, and they were worried about like insurance. They're offering us insurance. Um, maybe there's something wrong. So we talked to the clinic staff and said, when you, when you enroll people for the study, when you offer insurance, make sure you stress that we don't expect any problems with the trial. This is because just we appreciate your time and this is for your broader health needs. Um, so, but it was on a very regular basis and in real time. Um, and so I a think lot can that, actually be achieved, you know, by sort of yeah. meeting people halfway, I suppose, exactly. and explaining things to patients in ordinary terms that they understand. Exactly. And there's not enough of that, perhaps, at the moment. In general. <laughs> in, in life, generally, yeah. 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 Can, can I pick up on two things yeah. that Heidi said there? I, mean, I think that there are two really important points there. One is to do with communicating what's going on in a very clear and accessible way. Um, and the other is paying attention to communities. So I think in a kind of parallel story, I'm South African um, and I've written a lot about um, AIDS in South Africa. And we had a huge battle to get access to antiretroviral treatment, the drugs you need if you're HIV positive in South Africa. And then we finally got access to it and it looked as though public suspicion surrounding the treatment was going to mean that people didn't get tested or go and get the medication. Um, and so it was all gonna be for nothing in the end. But a couple of things turned it around. One was explaining really clearly what was going on in the treatment. So there was, oh, sorry, in the testing. So there were rumors going around that um, in fact, doctors were um, infecting patients with the disease um, rather than testing them for it. Um, and there's this great story that Johnny Steinberger, a South African sociologist, tells about a doctor getting up on a table at a, a testing center and taking his own blood um, and explaining what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly this hostile group of people calmed down um, because they could see that he was willing to take on the kind of risk he was asking from the people in the room. And so that was kind of a wonderful moment of science communication. But the other thing was really paying attention to what was going on in communities. So it turned the South African case around and meant that loads of people went and got tested and ultimately got treatment um, was community health groups. Um, so little support groups in villages is really what saved the day. And so mm. good science communication, community level stuff, both really important. So you need less top down, I suppose, less top down experts saying this is how it's got to be much more sort of grassroots people within the community talking to people from the same community. Yeah, I'll just throw in another question then from the um, from the Q&A. I'll put this to you, Catherine. Should vaccination be made compulsory? Oh, I'm very cautious about that. Um, so I, I'm always very cautious about trying to make things compulsory because people are always going to find loopholes or ways around and out of situations. I think that more successful interventions, and again, I'm cautious that there are more expert experts on this on the panel, more successful interventions are one that the ones that get people's buy-in um, because then people are substantially more likely to participate than those where we try to force people to do things. And so I could give a really long philosophical argument about you know, respecting people's autonomy um, and their bodily mm -hmm. integrity. But I think if we just go pragmatic and look at effectiveness, I'm very concerned that people are gonna find loopholes and that if we're able to get yeah. public buy-in, that's probably gonna be- So you think it wouldn't be ethical anyway, but also it just wouldn't work. Yeah, so but I think people, two different yeah. types of problems going on there. Mm, it would be the ultimate top down, you know, this attempt to control top down, making it compulsory. And, and I think, especially given that a lot of people's trust in science issues 
are actually problems with trust in government and trust in health agencies that given the level of distrust that people have in these organizations, trying to do something top down that way isn't going to be hugely successful or may not be hugely mm. successful. And Rohin, what's your view on this? In, in a way you're on the front line of if vaccinations were compulsory, it'd be doctors who would be in a way forced to give them to people who didn't want them. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd have to echo what Catherine said there, that uh, I'd have a lot, a lot of reservations about making anything compulsory. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, we only have to, to go back in, in recent memory when vaccination uptake was, was better. So it's not something that can be, um, that, that isn't, you know, that the only solution is to, to mandate it. Um, I do think um, that culturally, particularly in the West, you know, we have got this very strong culture of autonomy and, and freedom. And sometimes that can be the root of some of the, the problems we're encountering at the moment. But mm. I think forcing an intervention on, on a population is, is never going to really have the desired outcome. It is interesting, the link of you know, vaccination scepticism to, to other kinds of scepticism and, and perhaps libertarianism, you know, perhaps anti-lockdown <laughs> activism as well. Is that a link you've, you've seen in the real world, Heidi? Absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, when you look back historically, um, the, uh, the first anti-vaccine league in, uh, I guess, particularly Leicester, it was one of the hotbeds of anti-vaccine sentiment, but it was actually the league was called the Anti-Compulsory Vaccine League. Um, we have some of these old archives in our in the London School mm. of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, and I've spent a lot of time reading them. And some days I feel like we could just kind of update the print and change change the name of some of the vaccines. The the libertarian sentiments of "Don't tell us what to do" were writ large there. Um, so I think that is a very global and human sentiment it's expressing itself differently. And that's why it's amplified so much in the context of COVID because it's the deep seated resistance to being controlled by government. And, and that, you know, this is a, a huge opportunity for those who have been um, preaching what some are calling beyond vaccines, the health freedom movement. And that's really driven by these sentiments, which is, ironic because actually it's depriving people of their health um, by not co cooperating. Yeah, I mean, it's this question, to what extent is vaccine skepticism about facts and about misinformation and about people believing false things about the vaccines versus to what extent is it about values and about, you know, this genuine sense that I make my own decisions. I don't defer to others. What do you think, Catherine? So I definitely think that there's um, stuff going on about values here. Um, and I think that you don't even need to be extremely skeptical about vaccines. I think you just need to be quite vaccine hesitant and people mm. who are kind of cautious about getting vaccines yeah. to see this value stuff come into play. Um, there was a study at the end of last year, well, that was released, sorry, mid last year in France, um, in which they had done only 25, but 25 in-depth interviews with women mm. who were making choices um, about whether or not to vaccinate their children. And almost all of them were like cautious about vaccines, um, yeah. even though most of them actually ended up vaccinating. Um, and Maya Goldenberg in Canada has done work specifically on values and distrust in vaccines. And her argument is that what we see is health practitioners not even being able to get conversations off the ground um, with parents because they're talking about different value sets. And so the, the health practitioner is talking about population level data um, and the parent wants to know about the safety for their own child. Right. Um, and so they just have different values. And because they just keep on having these parallel conversations with each other, they can't really get a discussion going as a result of that. But I think another important point, and I was delighted when Heidi brought this up, is it isn't just about values. It's also about emotions and people being being scared and anxious and all of these negative emotions that then cause people not to want to engage with the health system. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I just, of, um, go on right in. Yep. Uh, 
just pick up on what you said there, Catherine, about the, the parallel conversations, because I think this, this is a, a key issue with, with communicating science and medicine to the public is, um, you know, something like statins, for example, which, which uh, you know, there's a huge amount written about in the press and a lot of patients have preconceived ideas. Um, and, you know, if we can tell patients all, all we like that statins will benefit the population as a whole, but if they ask me directly, will this drug benefit me? There's no way I can answer that. And I can't, I can't deal in, in absolutes. Whereas some of the people who are uh, sowing doubt in, in the medical profession can be a lot more confident in their assertions. They don't necessarily mm. have to adhere to, to, to the scientific method. And so that uncertainty, which is inherent to, to all of medicine, I think is something that we fail to convey uh, in, a, in a sort of adequate way. It's fascinating that point about sort of individual versus collective risk, because you know, with a vaccination, well, you could be the unlucky person. You, you, you could be the person who just has side effects and never would have got the disease anyway. And there will be some people like that. But what yeah. if the, the population, it's for the sake of the population that people need to take this. And that's a that can be a hard message to get across, you know, that you should do this thing, potentially do this thing to your own children for the population level benefit. And I think that's part of why paying attention to emotions is so important in all of this. Because if you were doing a kind of completely cold, rational risk assessment, you would say something like, oh, well, the risk to my own child is so tiny compared to the population level risk. But we know that when people are afraid, they engage in this kind of evidential biasing. And so then the risk looks substantially greater to your individual child than it looks mm. if you're just doing a cold assessment of the evidence. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, let's throw in another question from the, uh, the q and I mean, this is about worst case scenarios. I suppose it's a question for Heidi. <laughs> if large amounts of people refuse to take the vaccine. I'm sorry I'm it, associated with that. <laughs> Okay. No, I, I, I just <laughs> I suppose we, we can ask about best case scenarios as well but what is the what is the reasonable worst case scenario I suppose in terms of people refusing to take the vaccine and what would happen and what steps we could take in those circumstances but the COVID vaccine I think that's what the question is about yeah yeah well, the worst case scenario is that um, we continue in this cycle of um, lockdowns and distancing and, um, you know, at some point enough people, I guess, will be exposed, but we don't even know how long immunity lasts with this virus. Um, I mean, we, we just don't know. And we've already started to see cases um, uh, where people have gotten a second infection. Um, so uh, herd immunity may, may be a relatively short lived, which um, so, I mean, at some point, you know, historically, you start to get some um, lessening of, of the strength of the virus, and maybe less people will die. But do we really want that when we have the opportunity for mm -hmm. um, a vaccine? But I mean, we'll see, maybe we don't even have an opportunity. Yeah. For vaccine. There's another, right, it's Exactly, but I talked talked at the beginning about the idea of a wonder vaccine that is 100% effective. Yeah. I mean, that's not the reality, is it? Particularly not vaccines no against respiratory <laughs> viruses like flu. Yeah. I mean, and that that too is in there in that debate about trust, isn't it? I mean, how do you explain to people that this is the best we've got and you should take it? even though it isn't as effective as you want it to be. Yeah, especially since we, the likely, to me, I think the most likely scenario is, I think we will, I don't think we'll be without any vaccine. I think what we're gonna end up seeing is two or three or maybe even more um, vaccines with different levels of efficacy, different safety mm. profiles, and different doses. We've got some that are one dose, some that are two doses, well, a bit like with Ebola. Um, and, um, you know, then we'll have to say who gets what. And that sounds potentially dangerous for trust, isn't it? Particularly if you think you're getting the cheap vaccine yeah. and then the super rich are having this more expensive one. Yeah, we'll see uh, which ones are more expensive and which are cheaper. But um, 
um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those factors in there, but it certainly um, will breed, can breed confusion if we don't already start talking about those kind of scenarios and not wait for the 11th hour when we know which one made it to the winning, made it to the end. Mm. I mean, there's a question here that I think you've implicitly answered about what do you think of the Great Barrington Declaration, which was arguing for you know, achieving herd immunity through getting infected. I mean, that um, that works only if reinfection is not not likely, isn't it? That's the yeah. I I I wouldn't risk people's lives with that scenario. I mean, what do you think drives? I mean, this is the other part of the question. What do you think drives that kind of skepticism where you actually have quite a lot of people who are not non-experts, but are actually, you know, modelers, public health experts, doctors themselves expressing quite skeptical views about the idea of waiting for a vaccine. It, do you see that as fundamentally different in kind from the, the sort of everyday skepticism of the general public? Well, I think that um, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call it skepticism. I think that, you know, it's, it's actually smart to be um, thinking about not hanging your hat on something you don't have, uh, mm. that you don't have. Um, uh, I think that, you know, we do need to make every effort in the meanwhile to use other modes of containing the virus. Um, I think I think it's particularly risky to wait around for herd immunity with this virus that we're learning about every day. If we had much more fluency in what COVID is and what it can do, it would be a different story. But given mm. how complicated it is, how we're seeing really long-term effects, uh, neurological, heart, it's multi-organ. Um, we're seeing even for some mild cases, you can have later heart complications. With those kind of scenarios, I wouldn't risk people's lives. If we, if we knew better, if it was like the flu, you could get really sick for maybe two, three weeks, but then you know, you're know you over it and you know that mm. you've got some therapies that might be able to help treat it. That's a different story. We have no treatment and we really are learning every day about this virus. So in those cases, I wouldn't risk. Mm. Jonathan, I think you, you, you made a really important point by when you said that um, some of the people expressing, I guess what we could loosely call views that go against the, the kind of general consensus yeah. are scientifically educated. Um, so, you know, some people say that education is, is the way that will improve um, the belief in, in, in pseudoscience, but I'm not sure that's that's really the only solution. Uh, you know, we are getting people, uh, as you said, who, who are um, doctors and scientists. Mm. Um, and I think we have to remember that everybody has their own biases, irrespective of their level of education. Um, there's, there's an interesting debate within scientific circles about how we sort of deal with evidence of a rapidly changing sort of landscape. And I think the problem with, with COVID-19 is there's never been scrutiny on scientists like this in, in history, you know, with so much attention. Mm -hmm. And there are, I tried to get a figure, but there's something like 12,000 papers published about COVID-19 this year. This is not, this is not preprints, this is published papers. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, at some point you, you'll be able to, to find data that fits any argument. Um, but I guess the public is, is getting an insight into how messy science can be when we're getting towards yeah. a, a final answer. It's actually a real concern, isn't it? That mess, you know, where you think science is authoritative. If it's published in a peer reviewed journal, I should believe it. But then you have well, there's a paper retracted in the, in the Lancet earlier this year in a very high profile case. And you, you just, as you say, there's these thousands of papers. The, if you are a skeptic and if you are trying to develop a conspiracy theory, if you're trying to make people believe that all the test results are false positives or something like that, there's all kinds of things you can draw on. You can cherry pick hundreds of genuine scientific articles to make your case 
that's the problem for science, isn't it? What does science do to organize itself differently to stop that? That's a, that's a huge <laughs> question, to be honest. There's, there's all kinds of problems that could be mm. highlighted there. Partly um, problems with the, with the publication process that we, we tend to bias towards novelty and, and um, controversy rather than necessarily high quality, boring studies. Uh, which which um, may be more useful. Um, there there is, you know, problems with with peer review. So peer review doesn't necessarily mean that it's a guarantee of of a of a, a good paper. Um, and um, you know, there's there's just so much sig the, the signal to noise ratio at the moment for COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. You know, p unfortunately, you know, a lot of the stuff published has been has been really rubbish. And and uh, but you know that that is, I guess, how science works. Is you you have a kind of funnel plot, so some results up here to begin with, some down here, yeah. and then over time they narrow into consistency. But we're in the middle of that wide dispersion at the moment. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, Catherine, you you want to come well, in on this? I, I was just going to agree with Rowan's slightly earlier point about not being able to educate people out of their skepticism, because mm. I think that the picture is muddy as still when we take into account that it's not as though we get our public health interventions directly from the science them, scientists themselves. So even if we could cure all of our skepticism about the scientific process and trust that the scientists have got it covered, there's also these intermediary factors of government and public health institutions that make decisions on our behalf. Um, and that's how we get our public health interventions delivered to us. And so long as people are suspicious of their governments and suspicious of public health, administrations, there's still going to be a level of skepticism and unwillingness to participate in things like vaccination programs or mask programs or um, isolation programs. Um, and so I think that the, the picture is muddier still. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a few more questions that I want to take. I mean, one is about politicization. Do you think people who become skeptical of science and medicine also tend to think that science has become politicized and do you think there's a need to try and fight that and to depoliticize science what do you think catherine so i'm not sure that i fully understand the question so i suppose there are multiple ways of reading it one is a suspicion that mm. science is biased in various ways well, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the borderline between the scientific questions and the political questions has been very blurred in the case of covid 19 and you often see scientists weighing in on questions that have a political element, like, you know, should we lock down Manchester, that kind of question. Should that border be more strictly policed? Or do you think it's good that there's a bit of this blurring of it? I mean, I think I think that it's an inevitable blurring. So I think the, the, the concern underlying this question is one of biasing of the science. Um, so right at the beginning of this, Heidi made the point that people are suspicious of the vaccine because they're worried about a profit motive. So that's a different kind of concern about biasing, that there's a corporate interest. Um, but I think that there's going to be this blurry edge precisely because we need to make public health measures and those aren't strictly mm. scientific or political. It's kind of a muddle of both of them at the same time. And so there's kind of an, kind of an idealized picture of the world um, where we have scientists reporting on the scientific facts and politicians mm. making the value judgments um, on those scientific facts. And that's how things get done. But I think the reality is that there's an intermingling of these things. And that's a very natural, and a that, very natural thing to be happening at the boundary line. And division of labor. Thing. Yeah, it's turned out to be impossible, really, hasn't it? That they talk about following the science, being led by the science advisors advise ministers decide we've we've heard a lot of all of these slogans at least in this country but that that borderline is not really sharp is it in a way you, you do rely on the scientists to at least tell you what the realistic interventions are and what 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 public in health interventions are are realistic and which are not and that that involves some value judgments yeah and I, and I think that's I think that's fair and to be expected and I think being able to make the value judgments often requires a very detailed technical expertise on what's going on in the science that we can't expect our kind of deciders of values to do without those technical expertise. And so I think that's often a, a valuable thing that happens. Yeah. Heidi, are you with us at the moment? 
Yes, I'm yep. back. Sorry, that's my great. internet dropped. <laughs> it's okay. That's one of the joys of the uh, of the Zoom webinar. That when you're doing an event in a in a lecture theatre, the, the the panelists rarely just walk out in the middle of the <laughs> yes. event. Whereas it's just kind of part of the part of you the get, entertainment. You get the audience walking out, but not the panelists. Yeah. Patty was so outraged that she had to leave. <laughs> yeah, I hope we didn't offend you. There was a question here about how do we get more precise about the spectrum of vaccine hesitant positions? Because it's not just about anti-vaxxers versus the world, is it? There, are, there yeah. are grades and there are different types. What do you think the right way is to think about those categories? Well, I think WHO coined this term vaccine hesitancy in 2013. Uh, and I was initially, I, I thought it was really a, not a good choice. I've personally, we've kept the framing of confidence because you can be 0% confident, but you can be 100% mm. confident. And it, it has a bit more of a positive yeah. spin. But I do appreciate um, the use of hesitancy to capture that spectrum between those who are, you can call them pro and almost propagandistic, mm. and the anti, the people who are really genuinely set heels dug in against vaccines. Um, mm. And in that spectrum, you can have people that um, generally take vaccines, but have an issue with one, like the HPV vaccine has a lot of critics. Uh, although it's one mm. of our best vaccines and cancer preventing that, um, but, you know, or don't believe it's worth it, like the flu vaccine, you know, oh, um, I don't need that. Um, yeah but they'll take the other vaccines so and in a way so the, the example of chicken pox is quite interesting isn't it because they're the the mainstream view in the uk is the the hesitancy whereas in other countries they do have uh, vaccination programs against it yeah i'm it's um that's another actually really good point about how how country specific some of these concerns are too i mean france um uh, really, they're big. Uh, they have this real issue about the hepatitis B vaccine because they, at one point, had some suspicion. Some communities had a suspicion that it was linked to multiple sclerosis, even though there was no repeated inter in investigations found no link. It kind of stuck in the minds of the public. They they had no problem with the MMR vaccine, even though that was across the channel kind of the driving anxiety at the same, around the same time. So, and it's interesting because we do routine monitoring for the EU of the 28 uh, year, well, 27 plus UK um, <laughs> um, countries. And since uh, 2015, 2018, and we just did the 2020 data. Um, and in 2018, we added some vac specific vaccines. So we asked about, important safety effectiveness and religious compatibility of vaccines in general. And then we asked specifically about MMR vaccine and flu. And the maps of MMR confidence are very different from the maps in with flu. Uh, the flu vaccine confidence in France is way down, but their MMR confidence was not too bad. And it was just the opposite in other countries. So um, each have their own histories, mm -hmm. they have their own experiences, they have their own issues politically as well as um, historically, maybe they had a local issue somewhere. So that that also I find is, is mm. uh, another quick thing I'll point out is religion. Uh, we do ask this question about religious compatibility, religious or other beliefs. And what we find, and this is true to the, I mean, most religious texts were written way before vaccines even existed. So at the end of the day, it's all about interpretation. Um, but we see that you could be um, a Muslim in Indonesia, um, where, which is dominantly Muslim, or you could be a Muslim minority in another country. And when, um, when you're a majority religion, you're more likely to have confidence in the vaccine than when that same religion is in the minority role, which speaks to the politics of it all, that this isn't just about whether you're, you know, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever. It's about where you sit 
in that popula population mm. because at the end of the day, the government is mediating yeah. the distribution of vaccines. So it's this fascinating, complex picture. So we've got yeah. a few other a questions. Sorry. Yeah, of course. <laughs> then we'll take some more questions from the, the Q&A. So I, I thought that was all super fascinating. You said that in France, um, confidence in the flu vaccine is way down. And so I was wondering what that was confidence in. Is that a, like in the effectiveness of the flu vaccine? Is it kind of like, well, it doesn't really work, so why bother? Or is it about safety, like the concerns that some people have about the MMR vaccine? It's, it's actually, um, they're not confident that it, it's that it works that well, but it was particularly because around H1N1, they were furious with the government for the volumes of vaccine that they bought, um, that they felt like they were in bed with industry. They felt like WHO had overhyped the threat of H1N1. They felt like um, it was way, made way too quickly and the government was just giving money to industry to cover up for the speed of, of this vaccine. It was all kinds of issues in ways that were not happening in other European countries. But again, it reflected their already, France in our, all of our global studies is absolutely the most skeptical in the world when it comes to vaccines. So these histories and this underlying mm. ferment played itself out in that setting. What's interesting is you might've thought that Finland was the least confident because they were one of the countries that identified the link with H1N1 vaccine and narcolepsy in some rare cases. But because they have a history of resilience and positivism about vaccines that goes way back they, I mean, I'm glad that came up in Finland and not in France, because mm. in Finland, they managed the risk, they carried on, there were some people who had, you know, there was some knock on effect, but it speaks to how much the background resilience in the in the community uh, matters, trust and resilience. And there's an interesting question here about age groups, you said that levels of skepticism vary across countries but what about age groups is there a difference between boomers millennials and generation z well we see that in general over 65s are more confident about vaccines mostly because they were probably most of them alive to see um you know why we get them mm. in the first place and have seen the diseases and understand them and but mm. we also see the most skeptical cohort are um, the ages of parenting from kind of late 20s mm -hmm. to, um, you know, kind of towards 50, yeah. late, you know, 40, 40s to um, the younger ones, uh, the under 20s are a little less skeptical, but I think that's partly because they're not really thinking about vaccines. Um, mm. They're, you know, it's not, except for HPV vaccine, maybe, but um, it's not really so much in their orbit. It starts to become more of an issue yeah. when you start thinking about children, having children and vaccinating, and that's when it starts mm. coming. It is a big step, it. isn't it? That you don't really have to be a conspiracy theorist yeah. to feel unease, you know, imposing a medical intervention on your own children. It's a big step. Well, I, I guess one thing of your to... work is that we should understand yeah. that. Well, I think that's for, for exactly the reason you just said. I think, you know, what's happened in this acute polarization of the anti and the pro, um, we have uh, a lot of parents have come to me and said, you know, you need to talk to your colleagues to tell them to speak more nicely to us because they're, you know, you, you guys are losing a lot of us because we feel demonized that if we ask a question, you're gonna write us off as an, a, you know, a flat earther or something. Mm. That's literally what someone told me. We feel judged even just asking a question. And I think we should be in, you know, it's perfectly legitimate for a first time mother or any mother to be asking questions around vaccines, particularly given the amount of stuff uh, negative and, and wrong yeah. stuff. You want them to ask questions. It's better that they ask their doctor than go, you know, ask their hairdresser or whoever they ask. 
right people will talk about these things and then yeah it's, you know, the, the right information gets into those conversations yeah i mean we'll take some more questions from the q a in a moment there's there's some great ones in there but i also wanted to ask the three of you about solutions we've talked a lot about problems but if there was one one change you think you know should be made now to try and regain lost trust in the medical profession get vaccination rates up beyond where they need to be what would you what would you change what can we do should we start with uh, with you Heidi well I think it picks up from my last comment I think we need to be better listeners um, and and really have a bit of empathy for those asking questions it is a really difficult environment um, for people trying to make decisions about giving their children or making decisions for themselves. If you go online, there's a lot of awful stuff. Um, there's some good information. There's some very ambiguous information. There's some quite frightening information. So I think we have to have a bit more empathy mm -hmm. with parents who are questioning and concerned. Uh, I think that would take us a long way, just listening by itself and understanding yeah. that confusion can get us a, a really help with our trust relations. Mm. Rohan? Well, I guess as, as representative uh, for the, the medical profession here, um, I was gonna basically say a similar point there that I think we have to look at, at ourselves as um, being partially responsible for creating some of these issues, not just lack of listening when it comes to, to vaccination, but just in general, you know, I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with the interactions they have with their doctors these days, whether that's time pressures in the UK or money in the US. Um, so I think, you know, we have to be introspective as to, to the problems inherent within modern medicine that are making people sort of have doubts in us. Um, and, and just to, to, to kind of segue, I guess, also, the other thing I'm representing here is misinformation on the internet, hopefully not as a purveyor of it, but the internet <laughs> as, a, as a warrior of it, I suppose, is is I think we need to be mindful of, of the interaction. And, and again, I think Heidi raises some really important points that language is really, really important. And there are some very, you know, high profile people on the internet who just kind of go around kind of humiliating quacks and, and highlighting sort of, mm. you know, and, and using very sort of accusing accusatory language and I think that is you're just preaching to the choir there and and you know I think we need to yeah. be a bit more sensitive uh, on places like social media of actually having meaningful, mm. meaningful interactions rather than just so how do you go about that then I mean in your role as a, a sort of science communicator how do you escape the problem of preaching to the choir getting stuck in an echo chamber uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I have to be honest um <laughs> You know, I, I, the, the algorithms that um, uh, that run the, these social media platforms um, are extremely complex. No, I mean, even the, com the companies themselves don't understand them. That's the sort of nature mm. of how they, they continue to learn. I, I do think there has been progress. I, I have some sympathy for social media companies that they may not have seen this coming, but not enough to say that, that they're doing an adequate amount at the moment. Hmm. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a question about... I have one more thing to say on oh, that, sorry. Oh, so I agree with everything. <laughs> yeah, I, for, of people being I forgot to go to Catherine. Go on. Medical or otherwise. But, you know... Oh, I don't know what happened there. Never there mind. A, there, there was something glitchy, sorry. Yeah, I there think... was a glitch. Catherine, tell us about your solutions. <laughs> well, I, is, so I'm not sure that I have any solutions. I, I, so I agree totally with everything that Heidi and Rowan have said, but I also think that something we said right at the beginning is important, which is paying close attention to what's happening in communities. Um, and so people are going to speak to members of their communities about health issues, mm -hmm. sometimes over their medical practitioner. Um, so one way of doing this is via community health workers 
for people who have a little bit of medical training on some relevant issues, but are essentially members of the community and they get paid a salary to you know, have this role as a community health worker. And these have been extremely successful in many parts of the world. And part of why they're so successful is because they have this kind of intermediary status. They're a member of the community, so they understand the dynamics of that community mm. and what's going on and their concerns, but they're also more approachable than, the, than medical practitioners. Um, and so I think that yeah. there's often this problem that there's a big gulf between the community and the experts that's really difficult to overcome. It's difficult for experts to sympathetically sometimes take on the view of people's lives that are just very different from their own. And it's hard from the community's perspective sometimes to put their trust in people that feel very socioeconomically, politically, very different from them. And so I think paying attention to these intermediary groups of people is important. Mm. Yeah, thanks very much. Let's take some of these questions then from the Q&A. This one here about, do you see a, a link between hostility to vaccinations and clinging to the belief in some kind of magic bullet treatment like hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir? I can't imagine who they're thinking of here. Do you think those things are linked? Because it's quite a counterintuitive link, isn't it? Uh, Heidi, let's put that one to you. Um, I lost a couple words with my internet well, here. Can the you question is, do again? you think in some cases, skepticism about vaccinations is linked to a kind of excessive optimism in treatments like hydroxychloroquine? Oh, that's in the spectrum of reasons. It's not certainly not the only one, but I think where there is an alternative um, I mean, we've certainly seen this with a lot of the naturopathy, and as I mentioned before, this, um, you know, this 35,000 person, you know, um, study in the UK showed, you know, 54% believing in natural, natural ways rather than a vaccine, and, and I hear that a lot in discussions with parents, and that comes back to values, because this isn't often just about a vaccine. We're so focused in the health community about the vaccine. It's, it makes it more complex because a lot of these young mothers, it's part of a lifestyle. It's part of a choice. Home births, gluten-free or vegan diets. Uh, some have even stopped using contraceptives and going back to the old rhythm method um, to avoid putting you know, pills and, and foreign things in their system. Um, and, you know, we all know how well the rhythm method works, but there, you know, there are apps now for, for rhythm. So these are all ways to go back to nat to nature. And within that is, oh, yeah, and that means vaccine free childhood. So um, mm. for my for my children, so it's hard, it makes it much more challenging um, from the perspective of the healthcare professional, because you're, you're, it's a bigger, bigger issue. It's not just about the vaccine. Yeah, thanks. There's a great question here as well from a junior doctor who asks that, well, he says, it, in, in, in my experience, problems of trust are worse in black and minority ethnic patients. Are yes. there any focused approaches planned for improving trust in those patient groups? Should there be? Well, I think there are, but not enough. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I mean Rohin, certainly you... in the UK, there are some efforts in other countries, but go, go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. So, sorry, I, I cut out there. Was was this directed towards me? Or? Well, yeah, the, the question of uh, whether you think problems of trust are, worth, are worse among black and minority ethnic patients and whether there should be a focused approach on those groups. Um, I mean, I think, uh, sorry, my, my connection cut out a bit there. I think there has been, um, uh, you know, it's, it's been apparent there's been a disproportionate effect on black and minority ethnic groups in, in many countries. And uh, there, there is a perception that they have been Forgotten about or um, not, uh, uh, you know, sort of overlooked, and so I can I can fully understand if that is the case. I, I wouldn't want to say myself I'm not aware whether that's um, 
definitely the case. But I'm I'm from an Indian background myself, and I do know that um, the problem with with um, believing uh, pseudo scientific ideas within uh, Asian communities, in particularly the, this slightly older age group. Um, I, I don't know if I've, I've been told my internet connection is unstable here. Oh, I can still hear you. Is it? Um, hope everyone can. And, and, it, and it is a problem. And, and you know, um, so I, I wouldn't want to categorically answer whether that is the case, whether it is higher in UK uh, minority groups, but I could well believe it. Mm. And there's a there's an interesting question here as well about assuming supplies of a COVID vaccination will be limited as they usually are for other vaccinations like the flu vaccine. How should we distribute them among the population? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because do you go for the people who are most vulnerable? Do you go for the do you try and get the whole population or what do you what's the approach? Um, perhaps a question, that's a question for Heidi, I think. Are you muted currently? There we go, unmuted again. Yeah, it keeps um, automatically muting because my line is wobbly, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, can you repeat that? Uh, sorry. The question is about other... supposing supplies of a vaccination are limited as they probably yeah. will be for the COVID vaccine. How do you make those, those ethical judgments really about who should get it? Well, I think that um, there already has been um, guidance coming up and, and in terms of that, I mean, the first, first line, it looks like it'll be, I mean, and understandably healthcare providers, frontline workers who are not only themselves at risk, but risk quoting others. Um, so, but the other side of that story is we may have uh, enough vaccine, but people don't want it. So you could use mm. that opportunity to say, okay, it's, you, have a cho you have an opportunity here to take this vaccine. If you don't want it, there's a long line out there who wants it. Um, and in a way it'll motivate the ones who have access to it, maybe. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think those are the kinds of decisions and discussions that need to happen now and be ready with it for different scenarios um, with different vaccines. But also uh, it's really important. I mean, the first people we should be engaging now are healthcare providers, are the people mm. who will be giving the vaccinations as well as being encouraged or mandated to take mm. the vaccine. Because if they're not on board, we can, we can pack it up. I mean, uh, because they're gonna be confronted with a barrage of questions. And if they don't have their own self-confidence and the first question people are gonna say, did you take it? And if they yeah, didn't take it- You've gotta be it, able to say yes. Yeah, so we've got a lot of work to do just at that level. Mm. I think, so, you know, slight comparison, I mean, obviously it's different is, is the flu vaccine. and and how it's, it's a very visible thing in NHS hospitals. And there are posters up of members of staff that have had the vaccine and I got a little thicker and I'm aware that. And so that, you know, we're quite sort of performative and, and we, we, we demonstrative in the fact that we take the vaccine ourselves. So hopefully there is at least a kind of model to follow there. Mm, yep, let's hope so. There's a bit of typing noise there, Heidi. Um, so there's another question here about coercive measures. We talked earlier about should we force people to give, take the vaccine and, and, and there was agreement that that would be counterproductive. So question here, what about other coercive measures that fall short of forcing people to take the vaccine? For example, restricting access to schools for unvaccinated children. Is that too far? What do you think, Catherine? So I think, questions of coercion are always difficult because you are managing individual interests against population interests. My personal view on the school issue is that it is morally speaking permissible to restrict people who have COVID from going to schools and being in public places just because of the large public health risk as a result of that. Um, and so I think in that situation, you can balance 
the extreme public health risk against the individual autonomy issue in that case. And I, I think we see comparable um, comparable kinds of interventions when you have quarantines for people with extremely infectious diseases. Um, and although we think quarantine is extremely um, you know, coercive, extremely autonomy limiting, we think that it is such a public health risk not to quarantine people under certain circumstances, mm. like if they have Ebola, um, that we, under those circumstances, circumstances, think it's permissible. It's absolutely crucial to get that balance right, isn't it? To, you know, not going too far because then you erode the trust that you're trying to build. I mean, Heidi, what do you think about how that, that balance should be struck? And for, with schools, for example, is it appropriate to say you've got to be vaccinated to go to this school? Well, I think it depends on the vaccine and, and the risk. Um, it, it, we have to remember that these are not mandates for individuals because they're individuals. These are, if there are mandates, it is because you put yourselves, you put others at risk. So if you go going to school, working in a healthcare setting, it's about you're putting others at risk. So um, mm -hmm. I, I think that in general, I, I think it's the best thing is if you don't need a mandate, but if you do have something that's highly contagious and risky, um, like measles, for instance, um, that can be a very disabling and damaging virus. It's, it's hyper contagious. Um, you know, that's one thing and, and COVID, but I do think you cannot even think about a mandate if you don't have the adequate supply and the system to deliver it because then the system yeah. um, is not honest. You need to be absolutely read, mm. ready to deliver. And the worst thing for trust perhaps would be to have this coercive system saying you've got to and take this thing or there. terrible things yeah. will happen and then people can't actually access it. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be a disaster. Mm. Okay, we're very nearly out of time. I suppose I just want to end by asking you, you know, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. At the beginning, I introduced this idea that we're all thinking of, a, of vaccinations as being potentially an escape route from the COVID world into the light of the post-COVID world, whatever that is. Are you yeah. optimistic that vaccinations are gonna get us there or are you pessimistic? Uh, let's start with Heidi. Well, I'm optimistic that they they could certainly help um, in many ways. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a, I want I want to be optimistic, <laughs> and and that they can help. We can't rely on them alone. I don't mm. think we should sit around waiting for the Holy Grail. What do you think, Catherine? I feel like Scully in the X Files. Like I want to yes. believe. Um, yes. So I'm I, I'm really hopeful for a vaccine. I want it to be really effective so that I can go back to teaching in person. That's my selfish wish here. But then I, you know, read the scientific reports that we don't hold on to immunity for very long, and I hear mm. stories about repeat infections, and that makes me like plunge into a pit of despair. It could need to be again. an annual program, right? Like we have with the flu, we have annual vaccination programs that sure. so this is going to this is going to depend on how long we hold on to immunity right and how effective yeah, the vaccine yeah. is um and yeah, so yeah. yeah so there's there's big question marks around how regularly vaccination will happen and so yeah i think i think i'm like scaling the x-files i really want to believe <laughs> mm. rohan <laughs> it's a great metaphor <laughs> um i I mean, I, I think I'm generally an optimistic person, but I, I'm not sure we should hang too much hope on, on one particular intervention for some of the reasons already mentioned, the logistics, we don't know when it's going to be, you know, I think it's already sooner than, uh, you know, the first estimates were putting it far off and they seem to have been revised down. I'm not sure if that's mm. just due to us getting a bit overexcited or, or whether we need to stick to that original timeline. And I think the danger is if we start getting a too, too many steps ahead, then people kind of lose focus of the things we need to be doing now and, and placing all their eggs in, in one basket. So, so I'd exercise a bit of caution. Um, I don't know which character in the X-Files I'd, I'd be in this analogy, but uh, <laughs> so yeah. I'm not too sure. The cautious one, yeah. That's, that's uh, an old reference, isn't it? Um, 
<laughs> well, that, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. And thank you very much for all of your questions. We had some great questions there. We had many questions as well that we didn't have time to get to. But uh, nonetheless, thanks very much. Uh, my apologies if we didn't manage to answer your question. And thanks very much to all of our panelists, Catherine Furman, Rohan Francis, Heidi Larson, for a really interesting discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye.